Good morning, how's everyone doing? Uh, welcome to another chapel in February here today. A couple announcements for you to know this week. First of all, this Wednesday we have a missions market on the promenade on Wednesday night. Support those going on a mission trip, buy something from them to help raise funds. Today we have a spiritual formation workshop in the prayer chapel just over here. 2.30 and the topic is how to study the Bible. What a great opportunity if that's something you'd like to dive into a little bit more. Tomorrow night we have the gathering. If you haven't been, Tuesday night, 7.30, the gathering. We like to call it family time. It's an amazing worship night you're invited to. Also Thursday, sanctuary, another awesome worship and prayer night you have to be at. So next week at chapel, we have a special all worship musical chapel with some special guests from Faith Christian Center. It's gonna be an amazing day of worship together. Today, our very own Pastor Tim is speaking here today. Chappy, as we call him, we're excited about that. So let me read the scripture of today. We have Psalm 103, one to five. Why don't you guys stand up as we read this? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's worship. Be free, be free, be free, yeah I know you by 
celebrate this morning. Now I searched the world, but it couldn't fail me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. No, they're not. And you came along.
can take a seat. Thank you so much for worshiping. Well, how many of you uh, love that song? So the band is gonna come back and play two for us to close out chapel this morning. So we're doing things just a little bit different. So I hope that uh, you are prepared to worship just a little bit more before we leave the building today. Yeah? Thank you. So there's a lot we could talk about today. Um, for those of you that have uh, been paying attention, uh, this week is Integrity Week. Did you know that? Well, there's gonna be a campaign this week. You're gonna see posters everywhere. Your classes are going to be challenging us to uh, live a life of integrity. While you're a student, you know the temptations and the challenges that come with uh, being a student who has the pressures that uh, come along with homework and research and all of the challenges that it is to pass your classes, to do more than that, to excel. And so this week is going to be Integrity Week, so we could have talked about that. Uh, some of you are uh, avid listeners of podcasts. We could have talked about the idea of truth. You know, today it's really hard to figure out who's telling you the truth. Uh, you have heard the discussion and debate about the Spotify podcast of Joe Rogan. I don't know where you fall in relationship to that whole discussion. Some of you are going, who's Joe Rogan and what's a podcast? Oh, I'm sorry, so ask somebody. Big debate about that. So we could have talked about uh, all the things that make up our social media today, but I'm not talking about that. Or fear. Sometimes we just allow the things that are being discussed in popular culture to create fear. Whether it was the pandemic and what that drove us to fear. Whether it's um, discussions about wars. You know what's happening between the Ukraine and Russia. Some of those conversations can stir fear in people. There's a lot of things that's going on in our life that make us fearful or wondering if anybody's going to tell us the truth or am I going to stay away from compromising my integrity while I'm a student at GCU. So there's a lot of things beyond those three topics. But I started thinking about what passage of Scripture would kind of help us set a cornerstone for the foundation of our life when it comes to understanding what God is doing and who God is. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is kind of setting a cornerstone for the discussion of what he's going to share throughout that letter to that Corinthian church. And you know the story with Corinth. If you know anything about the New Testament, you know that Corinth was a troubled church full of division, full of debauchery, full of uh, confusion about theological ideas. And Paul is about ready to go down this list of dealing with lots of very important topics that were relevant to that church. It was a church that was a mess. It was all jacked up, just to say, the, uh, say it in simple terms. And so Paul was being led by the Spirit of God to pen a letter to that church to try to help them to understand how they should behave and how they should operate as a people of God in community. It's not much different than the way it is today. Uh, some of you have had great church experiences. Some of you have had really difficult church experiences. But as a community of people, many of whom share faith in Jesus Christ, we know how difficult it can be from week to week, month to month, semester to semester, how to keep our mind and our heart and our behavior in line. It was no different for that little church in Corinth. They were struggling with how to be God's people in that moment in that world. You know, coming out of the pandemic, a lot of churches really struggled to restart. Some fell right back into groove, but a lot of churches uh, just fell apart. And a lot of institutions are struggling, not knowing how, what the future has for them and how to understand what God is up to in their midst. So in the first couple chapters of uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul is kind of setting 
some boundaries on how to understand what he's going to talk about through the rest of the letter. He starts out in the first part of chapter one explaining uh, about his passion for sharing the gospel. The fact that Jesus came for the purpose of dying in our place to purchase our salvation. He rose from the dead to conquer death and its penalty. That was good news. And that was being shared all over uh, Palestine and the rest of the uh, developing world. The gospel was central to who Paul was and what he was all about. And then he starts shifting gears in chapter two, and that's where I wanna pick up, because he zeroes in on something that's gonna help them understand a lot of things down the road. So what I wanna focus on this morning is your relationship to the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit to you? What is his work in and through your life? What is your posture towards the idea of God as spirit who indwells the believer? Is it just a theological idea or is it a practice of your life where you consciously decide to give yourself to him, to be filled or to be controlled by him? Paul is saying, in essence, if we're gonna to get to all these things and you're gonna understand God like you should and how to live out, you are going to need to understand the work of the Holy Spirit. It says this in verses 10 through 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter two. It says this, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by God the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. Now, I don't know the tradition that you grew up in. Maybe the discussion of the Holy Spirit and his work in your life was something that was freely discussed and encouraged, and many of you say, yeah, 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 I get it, I'm engaged in it. But others, and I don't know what the percentage might be in this room, may not be sensitive towards the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You get what it means to follow Jesus, to read the Gospels and see how he interacted with people and try to put on that same behavior that Jesus had with others. You may have a good sense of what it means to see God as Father and Creator and maj majestic and large and in a way in which it keeps your heart humble. But what do you believe about the Holy Spirit? And I think what we read in this passage in chapter two, we're not gonna read the whole chapter, but what you'll sense and understand in that chapter is you will not understand God without the work of the Spirit in your life. To know God, to understand him, is contingent on the Holy Spirit giving you eyes to see things that you will not see in your own understanding. Paul knows what's coming. The litany of hard topics he's going to deal with, knowing that any walk of faith is gonna have ups and it's gonna have downs. It's gonna have stubbed toes and skint knees and moments of joy. It's gonna have all of that but in order to understand who God is and what he's about, we as his people need to be given to the work and the ministry of the Spirit of God. It is he that unlocks our eyes to be able to see who he is and what he's up to. Some of you right now are trying to figure out what's going on in your life. It's not making any sense. I'm trying to be good, I'm trying to walk the straight and narrow, and all of a sudden this is happening and that's happening, and it's really frustrating sometimes. 
Or sometimes you can kind of walk the line a little bit with Jesus and things will go great and you're going, well, should I be obedient? Is it really that important? And it's so confusing sometimes because when we're doing right, things are going wrong. And sometimes when we're kind of walking the edge and things are going okay, we get, we get a little confused. I mean, what's happening here? It is incumbent upon each one of us as God's people to understand we will not have eyes to see unless the Spirit of God gives us that vision. The second thing that the Holy Spirit does, and these are the only two things that I want to encourage you with this morning, is found in verse nine, so I'm going back a verse. It says this in verse nine. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. I don't know uh, if you grew up in church or not. I did not grow up in church. I wasn't a Sunday school kid. I came to Jesus when I was 18. Didn't come from a Christian home, clearly. My mom and dad were not given to faith. And then I got into church, and I was trying to watch, take my P's and Q's from everybody around me. Okay, they're doing that. I guess I should be doing that, and they're doing that. I guess I should be doing that. And one of the things that was really churchy was having a life verse. And I've never had a life verse. But if there is one verse that seems to echo in my heart and my mind, it is verse 9 of 1 Corinthians chapter two. Because it's been the experience of my walk with Jesus. There was no way I could have ever imagined how good God would be. My dad was a hard man, so my vision of a, of a father figure was hard and tough. He came from a, a whole different uh, stage in life. Uh, I was four, or he was 47 when I was born. So when I got into high school, he was the age of my friend's grandparents. So the era in which he lived was a hard, hard era. The experiences that he had in life made him a very tough man. So my thoughts of God as father were a little bit like that, like... He's gonna be hard and tough. And I was a little bit of an athlete, so it was kind of attractive, you know, to have a, a God who was stern. But what I didn't understand in my early walk with Jesus was this verse, that there was no way that my mind or my ears, my heart, my eyes could ever imagine the incredible things God would do and prepare for those who love him. It's a humbling verse. And I hope that you have discovered that. Maybe you're at the front end of your Christian walk and maybe you're still anticipating certain things. You're expecting God to do things, but you're not sure how it's all going to play out. Let me encourage you to have big expectations of him. He is good beyond your wildest imaginations. The things that he is preparing for you, your heart couldn't come up with. Some of it you may take a glimpse at here in this life, and man, I feel so blessed. When I got out of high school, all I wanted to do was play baseball. That's all I knew how to do. I wasn't very smart. I barely got out of high school, went to college to play baseball. That was my whole plan. I had no plan. And then my fledgling Christian walk started helping me understand that I really needed to follow Jesus as my master versus the sport that I was given to. And then Jesus started emerging in my own walk as being number one versus what I was about up to those years. And then I kind of stumbled into my walk with Jesus trying to figure out, I don't know what to do. How do you want to use me? I'm, I, you know, I'm not good at anything. I'm really not even good enough at baseball to take this too far. So what are you going to do with me? And the way Jesus uh, unfolded my life over these years has just been incredible. How amazing his goodness is. And here I am in, in the, the, the last few innings of my, my baseball game, so to speak, my professional life, and I get to hang out with a bunch of great college kids. 
It's awesome. I mean, how good is this? You know how many people want my job? And they should want my job. It is a great job to come every day to a place like this where I get to interact with people like you is a reflection of God's goodness to me. So what are you expecting from him? So I want to close with this story before the band comes back. In fact, you guys can already you can make your way back here so it doesn't feel a little awkward later. <laughs> um, I grew up in Southern California. I lived at the beach and I lived at uh, Disneyland. That seemed like the highlights of life in Southern California when I was a kid. A few years ago, I had my family there and we were um, making our way to the lines that you have to wait in. And so we were at Space Mountain, one of my all time favorite rides. Yeah. And so, you know, you wait in this long line outside and it's kind of got this little cover on it and it's hot. And then you finally get inside, you're getting closer to actually getting on the little phony rocket that you're supposed to ride through space on. It's a fast ride in the dark and the, the air conditioning's cool so you kind of, you know, get a little revived and you wait in your line and it winds itself down there as you're getting ready and you get into the little rocket and, and it takes off and you know you go inside that little tunnel and you start going up and at the end of the, the little climb is that planet that looks like it used to looks like a chocolate chip cookie I love chocolate chip cookies did I just say that or did I just think that but that is the truth and one of the reasons why I love that ride. But you get to the top of that ride and that rocket then goes off into the dark and they've got these speakers constructed in the little car that you're in that are right by your ears and they just blow your eardrums out. It's like awesome. And it has all these sounds and lights and you're flying through this thing. And so this one particular day we were on Space Mountain, we got down to the bottom of the ride and it stopped. In all my years of riding Space Mountain, it had never stopped. And there I was parked at the bottom with part of my family in this little car. And I'm thinking, oh no, have the other cars stopped? And I was waiting for the other rocket to run into the back of us. We sat there and the music was still going and then it turned off. And then all of a sudden, the lights went on. And I took a picture of Space Mountain with the lights on. And we sat there and I thought, well, what's gonna happen now? And I thought, wow. And I did what every human being would do with a smartphone. I took out my phone, started taking pictures, selfies. They didn't come out very well, so I'm not showing you any of those. Yeah. But here was one picture that was good enough to show you and all of a sudden it's like oh oh it's just a roller coaster with a bunch of metal tracks and and then the lights were starting to flicker and a guy come a, a ride attendant comes out of nowhere and he comes alongside of our little rocket and he says all right just hold on I'm like just hold on who is this guy and so he gets our little car and he starts pushing it on the side and he gets behind us and gets it going and we kind of roll back until we finally get off the ride or we come back to where you get off and they go, well, since it stalled on you, would you like to ride the ride again? We go, yeah, of course. <laughs> so we took the risk and it went back and we went through Space Mountain and had the great experience that is in. Here's my point. Life is much like Space Mountain. You wait for something great to happen and you finally get close to that next stage and you climb into the little rock and it takes off. You know, you graduate. You met her, whatever it is. And life is going great, but you're really not sure what's happening and what God is doing. The only way you're going to understand your life sometimes is when the Holy Spirit turns on the lights and gives you a whole different view of what's going on. So my encouragement to us today, and when I walked in uh, the arena, I was so encouraged because I knew I was going to speak to the ministry of the Holy Spirit this morning, and I wanted to encourage you to give yourself to him today, to let him fill you and lead you and give you an understanding of things that you can't understand in your own, on your own. 
The last song that the band will sing today is about the Holy Spirit's ministry in our lives. So I wanna encourage you, would you stand with us as we close in prayer, or I close this portion of the worship time together in prayer, and then we're gonna sing. And we're gonna sing to Jesus. We're gonna lift our hearts to him. We're gonna ask the Holy Spirit to fill us, to lead us, and give us those eyes and those ears that only he can. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the presence of the Spirit Holy Spirit, thank you for coming week in and week out to join us in this place and to fill our hearts and our minds with truth and encouragement and blessing. God, for some of my brothers and sisters here this morning, they need to understand how good you are and how you have their future in your hands. and to turn away from worry and fear and all the things that discourage us from walking in in courage to you and behind you and for you. So Lord, as we've seen these songs together this morning, I pray that you would give us as your people an open heart to the ministry of your spirit. We pray that the spirit would fill us And use us, not only in this place, but when we leave the doors of this building and go out into this campus and these classrooms and eateries and wherever we might find ourselves to be filled with the power of your spirit. So God, as best that we know how, right now in this moment, we yield ourselves to you. We pray that you'll lead us. And and, and that you'll be honored and glorified in this place. And that the hearts of your people will be encouraged because of your work in and through us. So God, I pray you bless us now. Be encouraged by our singing. And this time together we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Peace like a river, wash over me Immerse me in water, as deep as the sea
We hope that God softened your heart and that you were able to take something away from Pastor Toom's message. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>